on the state of the district. Some state that it's in. And thank you all for coming this morning. First, I, I just have to be amazed that I'm here, and then I thank you all for coming. Because getting up early is not something that I thrive on. I used to work in San Francisco and get up early all the time. I never thought a thing of it, but I fast got out of the habit. In any case, the first thing I'd like uh, to happen is have everybody introduce themselves. I'm Sheila Grilly. I'm Vice President of the Board of Trustees. I become president in December. And we'll start with the man who's so kind as to escort me in. Good morning. I'm Russell, the facilities manager here at Lockdown College. Huh? <laughs> I'm Kittle, I'm the IT manager at Business Hospital. And I'm also on the computer advisory board. Donald Gill, Antioch Unified School District Superintendent. Which high schools? Antioch Unified. Oh. Welcome. I'm Laura Cancinella. I'm on the school board in Pittsburgh. Good morning. I'm Abe Doctolero. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Pittsburgh Unified School District. Which school district? Pittsburgh Unified School District. We clung together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Donna Van Wert and I'm staff to the Contra Costa County Workforce Development Board. I'm Joe McCormick, Human Resources Manager at Soil Refining and we try to hire your graduates. So. Here was Shell Refinery? Oh, uh, no, it's not Shell. Tesoro. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell you I was on the Shell cap, but I'm not on the Tesoro cap. Oh. You've, you've missed the well, talent here. Enjoy. <laughs> um, Kim? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Tim Leong, uh, Director for Communications and Community Relations at the district. In the back. I'm Kevin Horan. I'm the Vice President for Instruction and Student Services here at Elms. Uh, um, hi, everybody. I'm just Sean Wolverine. I'm a former student here. And I'm a candidate for more than five years. What is your name again? Sean Wolverine. Good morning. I'm Karen Kermit. I'm Dean of Career and Executive Education at Los Adonis College. Good morning. I'm Ruth Gooden. And I'm with the Office of College Advancement at Los Good morning, I'm Connie Deal, Office of Instruction, Los Angeles College. Bob Cradivel, the new president at LMC. Welcome. I'm Helen Benjamin, Chancellor of the Community College District. Good morning, Secundra Malhi with Senator Mark Bissetnier's office. Moshe Demetri Zada, I'm with the Contra Costa Community College District, Vice Chancellor, Educational Services and Technology. And I'm John Alvin, Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services. Uh, I am Greg Enholm, and I, too, am a candidate for Ward 5 trustee in the November election. People at the desk, let your introduction up. Hi, my name is Jennifer Adams. I'm a senior executive assistant. You're what? Senior executive assistant? No, you're in the Lieutenant Ryan Hills, and I have a CP services here at LMC. Lieutenant Lady? I'm Lindy Mays. I'm the executive director of the Foundation here at the West Office College. So that's everybody? I believe so. Well, welcome. Um, I haven't done this before, so this is my first time through. By the end, by doing it two or three times, I'll just be going to have it all down. But what I'm going to show you uh, about Contra Costa College District, we're a district, a countywide district, and we have five, we have three colleges and two learning centers. And one of our learning centers is out here at uh, Brentwood, as you will see on the map, the college that we're at now. The district office is in Martinez. Contra Costa College is in San Pablo. I have the valid. Campo Valley College in Pleasant Hill and San Ramon in, in San Ramon. So that's the, the that are, those are the campuses, and we 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 service those areas and and have a headcount of 54,863 students 
in those five locations. And not, we have no students in the district office, except as workers, but in the three colleges and the two um, uh, learning centers. This shows who you are represented by, who the district is represented by. Uh, Bob Cologne up in East County, Tommy Vanderbrook in the central part of the county, John Marquez in, yes, John Marquez in Contra Costa, John Nedgerly in the San Ramon area, and yours truly, I'm up on the water in Martinez. Martinez and, and up to, not including Bay Point, but all that area, a little bit into Concord, a little bit into Walnut Creek. And here we have our student trustee, uh, Deborah Van Eckhar, who is just beginning her term this year. And I'm not sure, what colors is she from? Hospodonos. Hospodonos. Yes. Yay. She's a hometown girl for you. Yes. Uh, the district has, is celebrating its 63rd year as a community college district in this county. And uh, we had a number of celebrations in its 60th year. The county population in 1949, when the district began, was 249,322. They started the district in a, in a small building in Martinez. That campus was started in a small old elementary school that I happened to go to the elementary school in. Now the population in 2012 is 1,065,177. So it just shows the huge growth, mostly after the wars, and Contra Costa having some kind of delightful climate and all the right things that attract people has since grown more than many places. The colleges have 3,100 employees, including part-time faculty and students student employees, and 1,015 full-time employees in 2011. At this time, having given you all those numbers, which I expect you to remember because I'm giving you a test, no, not. I'm going to introduce the Chancellor of the District, Helen Benjamin. Thank you, Ms. Some of you we know. I want to publicly thank um, our superintendent for Antioch because he served on the hiring committee when we had our new president, uh, Bob Craddock. And so uh, I just want to express appreciation publicly for your representing. We did a good job. We? Yeah, we did a great <laughs> job. We did a great job. So thank you very much. He's a wonderful supporter of, of the college. And so I, I want to talk a little first about. Uh, nationally about community colleges, and then a little bit about the state. And so in the nation, I don't know whether you know this or not, there are approximately 1,200 community colleges. I think it's something like 1,167. And so we serve the largest number of students who participate in higher education in this country. And that's about 13 million students. That's just a lot of students who come to our, our, our colleges. We received quite a bit of attention as higher education entities since uh, President Obama was elected. He has uh, put some money into special programs for us to educate, especially for training the workforce, and that's something that we do well. And he has challenged us to increase the number of awards and certificates that we uh, award by five million by 2020, and he gave us that challenge when he came into office. And we'll show you the number, our numbers, that we need our part of that, our contribution to that. And we are working toward increasing our number. And then California's community college's contribution to this goal is a million, because we are, as you know, very large as a community college system. And there's a special national, national initiative entitled Reclaiming the American Dream, which was started by Dr. Walter Bumpus when he came into the seat of the president and CEO of our national organization, the American Association of Community Colleges. 
And so that effort is re-energizing, focusing, because as you know, and uh, Moshe Menzada, our Vice Chancellor, will talk to you about some of the changes that we're having to make as a result of a kind of critical look at what we do by a statewide task force. And so the same look is being taken nationally, and so the things are changing for us. And it's a wonderful document that pretty clearly outlines the things we need to do as community colleges in this nation so that people can be a part of that American dream. So if we look at California community colleges, we are uh, the largest higher education system in the country. There are 72 community college districts in this state, 112 colleges, and 71 educational centers. That's very large. We serve over 2.6 million students annually. The state, uh, in Temple Valley, we awarded uh, over 140,000 degrees and certificates. 80% of firefighters, law enforcement officers, EMTs receive their credentials at community colleges. 70% of the nurses who work in hospitals and other uh, medical agencies are educated at community colleges. And as you may or may not know, two of our colleges offer associate degrees in nurses. This one in nursing, this one in Contra Costa. And we, we know that the more education an individual receives, the more income the person will make. And a person receiving an associate degree in uh, his lifetime will make $400,000 more than a person who receives a high school degree. So there are advantages, financial ones, others as well, to attending a community college and completing a degree or certificate. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Alamine, our Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services, who will talk to you about some of our fiscal challenges, give you some detail to what you hear in the news. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor Benjamin. Uh, first, uh, I'll preface this by this is bad news, but it gets better. <laughs> and, and I'll start off with that because this really is. For a lot of us, not only in community colleges, but in education statewide, this is a horrible time. It is, we've never seen any of the challenges that we've seen thus far, and this district has responded very well fiscally and conservatively to maintain a number of quality programs and services to not only benefit the community, but the state at large, but the state at large. And we're trying to continue to do that, even as we have resources that have been diminished since 2008-2009. Since that time, we've lost approximately $21 million in general fund apportionment. We had a high of roughly $172 million in general fund revenue in 0809. We're currently down to roughly about $154 million. And I'm pretty sure most of the other school districts throughout the state have also experienced likewise reductions because they've been based upon, percentage-wise, based upon their size. So given where we are, we've taken a, a proportionate hit, but it's amounted to $21 million. The thing for this year, the governor's budget was built, predicated on the passage of Proposition 30. Well, Proposition 30 hasn't passed yet. If it does not pass, then our district, as of January 1, will have to implement a reduction of approximately $9.2 million. And we have no other alternatives but to implement it. If Proposition 30 does pass, however, because of how the funding is, is designated to be allocated out. Um, it doesn't result in any new money for the district. It basically keeps the status quo. Uh, we will maintain our current budget. Uh, the governor will allocate those funds out to other different areas throughout the state, but they also will assist us in part of the money that they've been deferring us, which statewide is close to about a billion dollars. So the California Community Colleges basically have about $900 million in deferrals which, for practical terms, we get our checks three months later. Three months later, it will be shipped right when we anticipate it. So, in other words, rather than be paying you in January, I give you your check in April. You have to figure out what you need to do for January, February, and March. That's the position that the state has put the community college system in, and that's what we're trying to deal with. For us, this creates a number of uh, cash flow challenges. Um, our monthly payroll is uh, somewhat over. $13 million, um, and I know a lot of individuals look at our reserve balances, 
but our reserve balances are sufficient enough for us to at least make two months worth of payroll and to keep the district afloat. And that also includes making payments to our vendors, which are an important part because those are community members. That is a local economic driver. If we are unable to pay our bills, then neither will they. One of the issues that we also have to deal with is property tax and enrollment fee revenue reductions. Um, as the enrollment fees have increased from $26 to $36 to $46, there have been some challenges and some nuances. And unfortunately, some students, when they see this uh, increasing cost of education, they decline to enroll in our colleges. Now, while you might hear, however, that we still have a number of unfunded students, we still serve students above what we're funded by the state, um, those numbers have been declining. Because essentially, while the state used to fund us in approximately 32,000 full-time equivalent students back in 08, 09, we're currently funded at 27,757 students. So as you can see, that's a full-time decline of roughly about 5,000 or so full-time equivalent students. An actual head count that could be anywhere from 10 to 15,000 students who we no longer serve because of the declining uh, apportionment that we receive from the state. Yet we still have been able to serve a small number above that funded amount, and currently we're serving roughly about 28,000 full-time equivalent students. But the overall part is that the decrease in our revenue has resulted in a number of lost jobs. Sections at all three colleges and two centers have been reduced. And more importantly, we're, we're serving a, a, a number of students which are less than what we would like to serve and who we need to serve. So if we're not trying to intentionally restrict access but unfortunately, with reducing revenues, we no longer have the capacity to serve everyone who wants to enter our doors. And that's something we're hoping to rectify by November 6th. Now, one of the things that you probably also find interesting is even though our employee costs have decreased as a result of reducing employees, um, unfortunately, our health and benefit costs have increased. So we've lost roughly about 10% of our workforce and this is equated to roughly about a payroll reduction of $12 million. However, our health and benefit costs have continued to increase. And roughly in 08, 09, we're roughly about 30 cents, 34 cents per dollar. We're going for our health care costs. We're now, we're now well over about 42, 43 cents per dollar. That's how drastic our health care costs have increased just over this three-year time frame. So we're continually trying to work to address how we do not only with our current health care costs, but of course our ongoing liability for uh, other post-employment benefits, if you were familiar with GASB 43 and 45. The district currently has a actuarial liability of roughly $173 million for our post-employment benefits. However, they, we have been able to put aside roughly about $67 million towards that liability, but we're continually evaluating ways how we can continue to address our health care costs, uh, even with health care reform and everything that's going on, so that we can not only maintain uh, good benefits for our employees, but also for our retirees as well. But this is an ongoing cost and uh, a pressure which we're still trying to wrangle with. Now, from the good, from the bad to the good. The voters of this county were able to, on two occasions, support us in bond measures that went before them in order for us to enhance uh, facilities which were built in the early 50s. In 2002, a $120 million bond program, Measure A, was passed by the voters, and that program is almost complete. We've made numerous additions and changes to not only Los Medanos College, but Contra Costa, Diablo Valley, and of course with the creation of the San Ramon Center. Um, and we're very proud of those facilities and the changes that were allowed to occur with this funding. We currently now are expending the last, some of the last remaining parts of the interest revenue, and of course our bond oversight committee will be issuing a report shortly after, as soon as those funds are fully and totally exhausted. We followed this up in 2006 because the $120 million bond, while it did address some structural and some seismic issues at the colleges, it still wasn't enough to basically totally retrofit and improve facilities, once again, that were built in the 1950s, and of course, Los Medanos being built in roughly about the early 70s, about 1974. So basically, we went back out in 2006 and got a $286 million bond measure, and we've issued approximately half of those funds. Um, some of the two major projects in that first bond issuance were the Diablo Valley Commons structure, which is a six-phase project. It's roughly about $55 million in total. Um, it would totally retrofit the or change the middle of the Diablo Valley campus to make it not only accessible for ADA, but also provide a classroom and 
classroom and building improvements for their culinary programs and their student services division as well as provide some additional instructional classroom space. Um, we also have a project which was held up at Contra Costa College due to the fact that it was Contra Costa College, if you did not know, there is a fault line that runs almost through the center of the campus. And there was a plan to redo the student service complex, which is student services building, the common center, which is also a Contra Costa. This building was held up until we were able to get approval from the state to proceed and redesign the actual building so that it did not sit along the fault line. Unfortunately, it was a mistake. Uh, it was a drawing error that was caught before we actually got into construction. And I'll reverse for just a second. In a previous district that I worked at, they didn't find out they had an error on the stairwell <coughs> when the building was built. And as they began to install the stairway, they found that it was short by a foot and a half. <laughs> now you can imagine the dismay of the district, of the chancellor, and more importantly, of the college. Um, and they did have to go back and, of course, sue the designer and basically almost start from scratch and tear down a good portion of that building in order to rebuild it. So in this case, instead of us having to have a building almost built or partially built on a fault line and they have to turn around and go back and rebuild it, the error was caught early enough for us to go back and have the designs redone so that we can have a project and a building that will be seismically safe and basically save us millions of dollars, save the taxpayers millions of dollars from having to do that and direct that retrofit again. So essentially, that project is getting ready to commence. And as soon as we basically complete some major completion on both of those two projects, and that project in, in essence is about $60 million. So as soon as we begin that project and get some substantial completion done, then we'll begin the process of issuing the remaining bonds so that we can begin other projects. And more importantly, one of the projects here is the LMC Core Remodel. There are some current things that are going on right now from the existing bond measures that are done, but as soon as we do the issuance for the remain, uh, remaining bond money, and basically, we can finish out the projects for not only LMC, which deal with the core and the athletics and some other program, some other buildings on campus, but also deal with the other seismic and other structural issues that still remain at DBC and CCC. As you know, basically, we only can use these bond funds for our capital projects that are identified. Our bond oversight committee has commended us on the fact that we have, unlike other districts in the state, have stuck to and have used these bond funds only for the things which have been identified and approved by the voters, and we'll continue to do that. Um, one of the highlights, phase two of the DBC Commons project, basically our projects uh, are, are being completed on time. They're moving forward with the exception of the delay, if any delays that occur from the state are getting documents approved, as noted in Contra Costa, but all of our projects are moving on time. This in particular is one of them we want to highlight. It will open in October 2012. So if any of you have a chance to make it to the Pleasant Hill area uh, and take a look at that facility, it will be, it is a very nice facility. Um, measure A of the bond project once again noted, we're doing the DBC Commons, LMC Corridor model, the CCC College uh, Center, and we are in plans to construct a new Brentwood Center. So we currently uh, have a site identified, um, however, we still are working through final uh, planning to figure out uh, what that campus will be uh, in order to not only meet the current demand, but a deep future demand. And those plans are currently being discussed. Now this is the jewel that uh, I wanted to highlight for you, and this is something that, as I noted earlier, um, there are a number of measures that are on the ballot this year. Um, one of the things that we have to do in order for us to continue to provide the level of services that we do is to seek new revenue. So one of the things that you will see on the November 6th ballot is a parcel tax measure for $11 per parcel. It is estimated that this measure will generate for us roughly about $3.9 million. The necessity of this is noted. We have instructional programs, services, particularly student support services, that have been drastically hit for the past three years. And for this year, if this $9 million reduction is implemented, if the governor's measure doesn't pass, which right now there's still some questions about whether it will, uh, particularly with the competing Prop 38 bill with model number. And for those of you that did not know, it's whichever measure garners the most vote is the measure that will be implemented. So even if the governor's measure was to pass, say, by 50.5%, and the Munger bill was 50.7, the Munger bill goes into effect. And that's just the long and short of it. 
So not as a, a supplemental or to replace the governor's measure, the district we decided and the board approved us going out for a parcel tax. This $11 parcel tax would begin in 2013 and end in six years unless the voters decided to approve it for future development duration. The funds from this measure will be used and provide any course offerings and instructional programs. Um, that for us is important because we've had a number of sections that have been reduced and lost, in some cases course sections needed for students to complete degrees and certificates, and that extends the length of time which they remain in the community college, and while that's great for us, at the same time, we want individuals to come to matriculate, move on, uh, get skills that are necessary for them to continue their careers or move on to four year colleges and universities. This will at least at some point allow us to maintain core programs and services that we need to allow them to achieve that goal. None of these funds will be used for administrative salaries. And once again, as you can see from the document cast out, it just gives you some initial information on what Measure A will do for the community college district, what our plans are for those funds. And of course, if you have any additional information, who to contact for that information. So with that, I'd like to bring up our Vice Chancellor for Education and Technology, Moshe Mizanata. I'd like to share some information with you on the state front and then get into a bit of detail about what we're doing locally uh, at our community colleges. So a little bit on the state front um, related to the student success task force recommendations. The California Community Colleges responded to Senate Bill 1143, uh, which is a bill to increase uh, student retention and uh, student completion rates. And we responded uh, by actually developing a statewide student success task force. Um, this large task force met over a, a series of greater than a year. There were uh, actually meetings that were hosted uh, locally at various uh, sites um, in which they received feedback uh, from other community colleges and uh, uh, members at large, including faculty, student service representatives, administrators, students. Uh, and others really engaged within the, uh, the community college community. Um, at this point, the task force has developed a set of recommendations and with all of the input included and uh, developed a, uh, a, ta a tax, re uh, excuse me, a reform package that has gone to the legislature, has very recently been approved by the legislature, and is now sitting on the governor's desk for final approval. So um, with that said, uh, I want to share with you just a couple of the highlights related to it. One is that the um, package actually talks about uh, making changes to our registration priorities. And some of you may have heard that at our community college district, we've already made some of the changes that are coming down the line by our legislatures. And that is, rather than uh, registering students based on the number of units that they have, so in the past, the larger number of units you had, the greater your priority was, the earlier you were able to register in classes. Um, as we were assessing that and learning about what's coming down from the state level, we determined that it would be best for us to uh, allow students who have uh, who are closest to actually completing their degree or certificate, so those in the 45 to 60 unit range, to have an opportunity to register and get the classes that they need so that they can reach the level of completion necessary, rather than students who may have upwards of 100 units, um, and frankly we do have students that have over 300 units at our community colleges. Yes. Um, so we really wanted students that want to leave have an opportunity to give the classes <laughs> to actually uh, move forward and obtain uh, their goals. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, Student Success Task Force is indicating that an, uh, other levels of priority should be uh, initiated, and specifically students that matriculate with us. So students that come in and complete an educational plan, uh, complete their assessments, and are ready to take the classes that they really need to obtain their goals would have higher priority. So um, for those of you representing our K-12 districts, I think it'll be a really great opportunity for your students um, as we work with them and matriculate them into our organizations to have higher priority in order to get the classes that they need and move on through our system. 
the legislation that's being discussed also um, really needs some resources tied to it. Currently, there are no resources tied to it, but there are discussions about uh, additional resources. So for example, we are required to provide students with an educational plan. Every student is required to have an educational plan. Well, as you might imagine, uh, developing an educational plan requires some meeting, meetings with counselors, having some dialogue with students on generally a one-to-one -one basis, um, and that's not easy to come by given the resources that we have today. So uh, really additional resources are necessary and we're hoping that they will be coming down the line. Uh, specifically, this act is going to contribute to the success um, of our students by increasing the uh, awards and certificates that we that we offer, and, uh, and actually not that we offer, but that students actually attain. Um, our goal here at the district, um, our chancellor mentioned to you uh, the, uh, the goal that our president has set forward to us on a national level and what our numbers are at the state level. Um, but here at the district, um, we've actually looked at those numbers and determined what, what, what we need to do to do our part in achieving uh, the, the, the dream um, as we have it. And that is, we need to double the number of degrees that students attain um, at our colleges, and we need to quadruple the number of certificates. So those are goals that we have that are part of our uh, district-wide strategic plan, and we measure these goals on an annual basis. And I can tell you, the last review that we did, we have shown a 25% increase year to year in the number of degrees and certificates that students have attained with us. Uh, another element at the state level is Senate Bill 1440 that's focused on transfer degrees. Um, it was signed into law in 2010 and it requires community colleges to offer an associate's degree that ensures a seat at the California State University system. So um, the, it provides students with a, uh, a much more clear pathway to go into the CSU without taking unnecessary classes. Uh, at the community college, really uh, having a very direct, really plan on how to get from here to the CSU. Um, a maximum of 60 units um, is a part of that AA or AS in transfer, and it guarantees junior status at the CS CSU level. Um, at this point, there are 10 transfer degrees that have been approved for the entire district here, um, all three of our colleges have developed 10 of these transfer degrees. And the way that this happens is as soon as um, the CSUs identify, actually create the, the transfer degree package um, with dialogue uh, at the community college level, as those are actually approved at the state level, then our curriculum committees work to uh, uh, articulate those and ensure that we have developed those at the local level they go through approval through our governing boards, and then finally um, up to our chancellor's office uh, for approval, and those are offered to our students. Um, I can tell you it's actually made quite a bit of difference. Um, you know that the CSUs are uh, closing uh, their doors, um, unfortunately. There are uh, fewer and fewer opportunities for transfer for our local students. Um, however, they are guaranteeing admittance to those that are in the transfer pathway. So for those that, that have chosen the AA or the AS in transfer, there are guaranteed admissions and guaranteed admissions as best as they can the local CSU. If, if the, uh, the degree that the student is interested in is not offered at the local CSU, then uh, it's, it's at uh, uh, as close to CSU as, as, they can get, as, as we can get it. Um, a similar agreement is expected to be worked out with the UC system. It is currently not in place. We're hoping uh, that, um, that this is a, 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 an issue that will move forward. We do have a considerable number of students that are interested um, in the UC system and a large number of transfers to UC Davis um, for students here at uh, uh, Los Medanos College but also UC Berkeley. Um, I mentioned to you that there are things that we uh, look at on an annual basis. Um, this um, particular item that you're looking at um, addresses our achievement gap efforts. We review a dashboard. It's essentially our gauge to see how we're doing in the area of the achievement gap um, uh, every year with our governing board. 
And um, as you look, uh, right here are the measures that we have been looking at annually. So we look to see if our students are transfer prepared. Have they completed 60 units? Um, are they transferable units? Uh, have they completed transfer level math and English? If they have, they are considered transfer prepared. We look to see how many of our students are actually transferring to the uh, UCs and CSUs. Uh, we have those numbers uh, that we obtain. We look to see how many degrees and certificates our students um, are awarded, um, how they're doing in their career technical education courses, what are their success uh, rates and patterns. Um, we look at their success in basic skills math, English, and in ESL, English is a second language. And as we do this, so you'll notice there's, um, there are lots of colors here, um, and I like to say our chancellor calls this the stars and stripes, um, because ultimately what we care about is to ensure that we have as many stars as possible. Um, what this really means is that as we look at the various ethnic categories here, um, we want to ensure that we are closing the gap between those that are, that are succeeding at the highest levels and those that are struggling. Um, and when we see that there are green boxes, it means that we're making some level of improvement from the prior year. When we see the red, there is not improvement that has been made, and unfortunately that there has been a decline from the prior year. And what we know, and I won't tell you all of the details because there's a lot of coding that goes behind this document that you see, um, but uh, our goal here really is to see much more green and then ultimately the stars. As you look down this line, you'll notice that our African American and our Latino students are the ones that tend to suffer the most. And we focus on directing resources to improve their success and reach a level uh, in which we have hopefully at some point eliminated this achievement gap. Reductions in educational offerings. Um, and this information is on a fall to fall basis. So from fall of 2011 to fall of 2012, the current semester that we're in, um, we're certainly seeing a reduction of course sections, and, and there are fewer students that we're serving. Overall, as a district, uh, we have 411 fewer students here this fall, and I'm talking district-wide, than we had last fall. Um, that is because we have 103 fewer course sections that are offered. Uh, and ultimately, those students that you see, although we have 411 fewer students, there are actually many more students that are not able to get all of the courses that they need, so they are enrolled in fewer units as a result, and you're not seeing that in this mix. Um, and as you can imagine, 103 fewer course sections is a considerable number if you consider you know, maybe 30 or 35 uh, seats per course. If the tax initiative does not pass, we expect that we are going to be serving 4,600 fewer students within a one-year time frame. And with that, I will turn it over to our president. <coughs> Thank you very much. The interesting, this one, the interesting thing about uh, that issue, incidentally, is that uh, three colleges and most colleges in California have the dilemma of uh, putting their spring schedule out. So we're actually building the schedule now, and um, uh, you can imagine the difficulty of planning for something that you're not sure what's going to happen in November, right? So we're planning the worst case and the best case, and so we'll have a schedule ready to go uh, on November 7th, in essence, that says yes, we can put a few more classes on the schedule or we'll have to reduce. So it's a complicated uh, process. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm just very pleased to be the president of Los Medanos. Uh, I've been here since July, so um, I actually have some notes that I'm going to have to read uh, from to have some of the facts and figures uh, that I wanted to present today. But uh, as John mentioned, uh, the campus uh, was begun in 74 opened up with uh, what he referred to as that core building, which now is going to be and has been under renovation for some time and is in the process of having some continued renovation. In fact, the president's office 
Um, now that I'm here, I'm going to have to move out of my digs uh, in two months and have some temporary space for about two and a half years, I'm told. So I'll have um, a new environment uh, shortly. Our service area, uh, I think, uh, as uh, Sheila mentioned, it, it expands quite a bit of space. Uh, it goes from Bay Point all the way to Bethel Island and Oakley and, and down a little bit into Contra Costa and to uh, Clayton. Uh, so it's a fairly expansive area. You know that we're uh, one of three campuses, Diablo Valley and Contra Costa being the other two. Uh, popular majors, liberal studies, nursing, engineering, math and English, obviously, physical and biological sciences. We have a fire technology program. Uh, child development, uh, administration of justice uh, program, uh, process technology, which is fairly a uh, new one that uh, works with uh, some of the refineries nearby, and electrical and instrumentation technology. Um, we have about 111 full-time faculty and almost 200, uh, a little bit more than 250 adjuncts or part-time faculty. And I've been speaking with uh, as many people as I can. One of my objectives is to uh, meet personally with all of the faculty and staff of the college. And I probably visited with about 40 people so far in 20 to 30 minute segments and have met quite a few of the uh, part-time faculty. And for those of you who aren't aware, those are sometimes referred to as three-way flyers. Um, <laughs> they go from college to college to college, and unfortunately, oops, what's the wrong way? Um, unfortunately, as was mentioned, we've had to cut out a lot of courses, and so those have really impacted the part-time faculty uh, statewide, but particularly here at Los Medanos, uh, because of course sections, a lot of the adjuncts have basically lost their jobs, which is quite unfortunate. Um, we have uh, 268 um, uh, part-time faculty, 100 classified staff, and I can't emphasize as those of you from school districts how important the classified staff are. Those are really the people who uh, help uh, make sure that labs are set up, uh, make sure that uh, financial aid is processed and, and uh, admissions of records, transcripts, and the whole variety of things. So they're an essential component of our campus. And we have uh, 24 managers, uh, including our new manager, uh, Kevin Horan, who's the Vice President of Instruction and Student Services. Uh, <clears throat> enrollment, uh, we have up and down, as most uh, mentioned, uh, we had close to 10,000 students just a short time ago, but uh, now we're just short, just a little bit higher than 9,000 students as of fall of last year. It's going to be a little bit less, uh, we expect, uh, when the final numbers come out this fall. Uh, you see the breakdown of our student body, 56% female, uh, which again is fairly typical, I think, in community colleges in California. And the average age might surprise you, but 26. Uh, so in the old days, it used to be that uh, we took many, many people from high school, and so the, the age would have been very low. But um, we have a lot of returning uh, folks uh, from who are adults, but we also, uh, this may surprise you, have people who have gone into the CSU and also now are coming back to community college to take classes. So uh, it's a real mix of folks. Uh, demographics of our students you see there. And um, the total awards uh, in uh, 2010 of 1,031 is, uh, Maybe you don't think that's a high number, but that's actually a very good number. Uh, we had AA and AS degrees of 590 and certificates of 441. So good breakdown of uh, awards at the college. And then we have uh, 61 in 2010, 61 uh, students transferred to UC and 225 to CSU, which again is a, is a pretty good number. Uh, my former college, uh, Las Positas and Livermore, had uh, numbers about that same, uh, and it's about the same size college, so it is representative of community colleges. Um, just a thank you to the community. As John mentioned, uh, Measure A and A uh, are just incredible contributions to the district at large, but also uh, in particular to Los Medanos. We have 
so much new construction, and I don't know if you've had an opportunity. Uh, hopefully, uh, if we end before 9, you'll have a chance just to walk around the, um, the quad and see. You can see left to right the new buildings, this being among them, the library building, uh, the math and science buildings, uh, planetarium, and this whole quad area. And then as you go south, look to the right, and that's the core building, which in essence was the initial building of the college where everything was included in it. Uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting environment inside because it's you're both inside and outside at the same time. It's a, an oddity, but so that whole building is going to be pushed a little bit, uh, uh, expanded to the east uh, to uh, make more room in that. Um, so that's part of the remodeling of uh, what you see there, child development, uh, nursing and EMT, fabulous addition to the college with the renovations that have occurred there. And then there's uh, these other offices that also are undergoing uh, rework. Um, <clears throat> the Brentwood Center, as we mentioned, um, is uh, a real critical component uh, of our district, but uh, it is tied to Los Medanos, so uh, it falls under um, uh, Los Medanos leadership. We have started in uh, 89 uh, there in East County, where we initially uh, partnered with the city of Brentwood to open it. Uh, I understand it was first housed in the Liberty Union High School District's Adult Education Center, but then it was moved to an old uh, supermarket, and it's currently uh, under some remodel there, some additional lab space is uh, being put in there so that we can have some uh, science uh, labs at that facility. But then ultimately, uh, we the district has purchased some property that uh, there will be a, a new center built. And you see the numbers uh, there. It currently, we're uh, about 5,000, and we expect to um, have about 7,000 students there. Now, funding is still an issue. It's a fairly long, complicated process to make sure that that all gets approved and what have you. But we have the site, and we expect that uh, if all things go right, that we can open as early as fall of 2017 but how to make sure that we're operating and sufficiently uh, with funding and, and um, you know, to make sure that the appropriate faculty and staff are there is uh, still something that has to be worked out. Um, just a couple quick things that I asked uh, folks to provide me some information, but one of the things that's really important, and as you all remember your days in college, which for me, it wasn't just yesterday, you know, but uh, in any case, uh, being involved in student organizations and clubs and things like that is not only uh, important uh, to make sure that uh, there's active engagement, it's been uh, tied to student success. There's evidence that the more students are engaged with their faculty, um, involved in student organizations and clubs, staying on campus as much as possible rather than as many com commuter campuses do, you come in and, and you leave. If there is some active engagement on the campus, uh, that leads to better um, uh, grades and, and student success. So consequently, I wanted to say that in the last year and a half, our student clubs, have, uh, the activity has increased 61%. So that's really a good evidence, I think, of the, the managers and the classified staff promoting that and certainly the students getting involved. So um, I think that's a, a real uh, asset to the college. Uh, we've designed a new student orientation process. Again, orientations, people coming in from high school in particular. <clears throat> Many students don't know what college is all about. And so having those orientation programs, uh, again, making that available, where the library is, how the library works, where financial aid is, how to go through the right steps is really important. And um, we had uh, last year 1,350 students uh, participate in those orientations, and as importantly, 425 parents participated. And again, I think we can't emphasize the fact that we need to go out and make sure parents understand how this works, because uh, the support uh, by parents uh, like mine uh, uh, was real critical to my success in it. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to say, uh, 
money doesn't grow on trees, and as John pointed out, it's not growing uh, at the state level either. And so uh, our university advancement office, uh, Ruth Gooden uh, is the leader of that, uh, raised uh, almost $5 million last year in a variety of grants that are helping, directly helping students, but are also uh, helping, uh, I hate to use this word, subsidize some other things because without them, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the services uh, that we have on campus. So I applaud Ruth and, and her staff's work uh, in generating those dollars that are essential for our success. And now I'm turning it over to... <laughs> Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Very, very much. So that's kind of the, the overview. And just to summarize, and then of course, I know you've been talked to, I'll say, and not add, talked to. Now we want to talk with you. But in, in summarizing, you've heard a lot about uh, money and the financial challenges that we face. And this particular uh, crisis, for lack of a better word, I, I don't like to talk, but anyway, a uh, challenge that we're having is an extended one. We're in the fourth year of it, and it's very unusual for all of us who work here. We haven't experienced anything this long, so when we got midway through the second year and realized that it was going to be, um, at, it seems, I don't want to use it, enduring, but it feels that way, we were going to have this for a long time and that our approach to it needed to be different than our uh, approaches in previous budget challenges because previously they would be a year or two, but this is extended. And so we made a decision that we wouldn't do certain things that we've done before, like to people were accustomed to us saying we were going to freeze this, that, or the other, you know, and so we wouldn't have people do professional development or anything like that that required money, and we thought, well, we know we can't do salary increases. So we decided we would continue for as long as we could, and we still are giving staff and column longevity increases to people, because that has a, an effect on people who come into the organization and who are new. And we thought that was important. It was a, a value that the board held. And we wanted to continue professional development opportunities for people, maybe not at the level we had in the past, but that's a morale building for people. I mean, if you take away every single thing, then um, it brings the workforce down even more. And we wanted people to still wake up in the morning and say, I want to go to work at one of the colleges or at the district office in Contra Costa. So we made those decisions in a conscious way. It was a little difficult for people to get used to that because it, it appeared that we were still spending money, and we were, but we weren't at the rate that we were before. So now people are into it, I think they, to appreciate the fact that we kept some of those uh, values in place for them. And so it has not, and is not, has not been, and is not easy. Uh, it's, it's very challenging for us. We've tried to be as creative as we can in the way we lay people off. We've tried to do more reductions in the time that people work rather than to take whole positions. So we've had a little strategy trying to wait to see how things are going to change, but keep our institutions whole. And you can see also that we still have lots of initiatives going on. We know that the bottom line for us is serving students and helping them reach their educational goals. And we did not want to be sidetracked by that because we are always going to have some kind of challenge. This time, and most of the time, it happens to be money, but we're not going to get bogged down in that fact. And so we have the orientations. We encourage our students to join the clubs. We're doing all this work on closing the achievement gap. We've got work to do. We've got limited resources to use in doing that work, but we are still continuing to do that work. And, and that's the approach that we've taken and will continue to take. And so we are committed to providing affordable, and let me add on affordable, that you may or may not, most of you in here know this though, but many people think that we set the fee. We don't set the fee. We have no control over how much people pay uh, for their courses that is set by the state. And as John showed you, it's gone 26 to 36 to 46 within the last five years. 
but it's, it's most definitely affordable. It's the lowest community college tuition in the nation. Uh, quality educational opportunities for our students and for our communities. And so we still are committed to that. That is our goal. And we continue, even in these times, to, to keep that commitment. Uh, we know that higher education plays a key role in the state's economic recovery and helps meet essential workforce needs. And we've started, I think, doing even more in workforce and economic development. We put a position at the district office. We've gone for grants in a different way as a district. And we're partnering with other districts. We've had to change the way we operate in this environment. And I think it's worked to the advantage of our students and our communities. Uh, we are forced to reprioritize who we serve and what programs and services we can offer. The state is really putting pressure on us. Um, Moji gave you the example of students who have more than 100 units. And this prior, uh, prioritizing for registration, those students are now at the end. They've been in our colleges. They love us. They love us. They stay and stay and stay. And so we're trying to help them make some decisions about their futures that don't include our colleges. <laughs> we want them to go to the next, the next level. They, they may come back as our employees or whatever, but you know, they've spent quite a bit of time with us right now. So we're reprioritizing that. And we know that in our county, in certain parts of our county, we have students who are very challenged academically. <coughs> And the community college is the only place for them to go. And we are trying to make sure that those students are not locked out. Those students don't have the kind of savvy that students have who come from homes where education is a higher education is a priority, where they have families that have gone to college and so they know how important it is and how to work the system. So we are very mindful of those students and so we continue to have programs and services that meet the needs of them and help them meet their educational goals as well. And so we know that a long-term stable funding solution is critical. It's difficult right now to see, as I said, this is an extended uh, budget challenge, but we are, as John indicated, and gave information on the parcel tax, that's one way. And when I talk to people about the parcel tax, they'll say, that's not enough money. And we say, we know. We just don't want to ask for a whole lot. We just need something to help us maintain. That's not going to really enable us to add a whole lot of sections. That will enable us to maintain where we are in 12-13. Because we know that 13-14 is going to be even more challenging. We already know that. And so that's one source of revenue. And then uh, Ms. Cradwell indicated how much money this college has secured in grant funding, and the other colleges have as well, and that's another source of revenue for us. So we're looking at all the different kinds of ways that uh, we can supplement our income at this point. And so we encourage your participation, your input, and now it's your turn. We're done talking. So you may ask any questions or make any comments that you'd like at this time. Don't be shy. Did we do that well? <laughs> so, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Sean. Um, I had a question. From a lot of people who are in yes, my ward, which is Ward 5, they've talked about the Brentwood Center and this is the size. Can you speak up a little A lot of people um, have talked about the Brentwood Center and the size of it. Is the Brentwood Center the construction of it in a, um, constructed in a way where we can futurely build on it to expand it, or is it just when it's built, it's built the current size and it can't be added on to let add, add it on later in the future? What, what we've done with the Brentwood Center, we purchased land already. We use bond funds to purchase the uh, property, and it will be a new campus similar to the San Ramon Center. Mm -hmm. It'll be brand new. Uh, we have a lease for the space we're using right now, and, and Kevin can talk about it better than I can, but we've expanded that space. I guess now this may be the fourth expansion. Fifth. Fifth, yeah. So we keep adding to that, but it's going to be at least five years before we uh, have a center on the, on the property we've purchased. Okay. I would just add that the, the I would just add that the current center is approximately 21,000 square feet, and the planned new campus will be approximately 90,000 square feet. So it'll be a tremendous growth in space, and the space will be designed specifically for our needs, whereas right now this, the, well, the center is kind of a, a makeshift uh, space allocation. 
Yes. Um, to that question, what I thought I heard Deshaun asking is once that um, campus is built, can it be, is there a way that it could be expanded if the need is there? Or, yeah, or are we locked into to be? That's what I thought yeah, I heard. That's what I was asking. So, because a lot of people are saying they're not happy with the size of uh, what it's going to be. Can we expand on it later if there's a need to? I suppose so. That's all I can say to you. Because I'm at Ray's not here. We the our facilities planner. I'm sure we could probably go up. We only have I've forgotten how many acres. So the physical space is only so long. Well, you should stop driving the, the cars and took the bus to school. <laughs> well, the um, the center is is the new center site is 17 acres, uh, which is more than double the site size for our San Ramon Center, and uh, it is built out to match the projections of growth in the Far East County. So it is designed to meet the growth projections over the next 30 years for Far East County. So it is completely accurate. That's great. Um, yeah, Greg and Holman, uh, along with uh, Deshaun and uh, Mr. Borsick were three candidates for the Ward 5 seat, and this is something that I agree. I talk with voters, they ask. One of the fundamental questions I've asked is, how much input has the community had in terms of the location and the size of the campus? Because the voters that I talk with say they don't recall having any public hearings that they could come to and give their input to that. They don't recall it because they didn't have the opportunity. What we did was to solicit uh, RFPs from uh, different uh, entities in the community uh, for land that was available. Mm -hmm. We received 13, if I'm remembering this correctly, 13 proposals. We narrowed those 13 down to three, I think. Mm -hmm. And the board then looked at all those. We had presentations. We hired um, a consultant to help us. There's a, a, I learned more about purchasing land than I ever desired to know. And anyway, we desired to narrow down to three and then selected one from, from those. And the board made that decision. We didn't request any community input on it at all. A lot of a lot of the selection process has to do with dollars and cents, necessarily. I mean, you have to pick a site that you can afford, where you have no site and no campus. So uh, I think I think we did the best job we could. I, I think so. We a good and then there was a lot of research on it. And if you're interested, I can direct you to the board mm -hmm. minutes about all the discussions. But we spent uh, over a year mm -hmm. um, researching and doing all the required work and soliciting the property. Um, and then we had, then the other piece of it was that we had land that had been donated to us. And yeah. so we had to do, that had to be incorporated in the deal. So it was a very complicated transaction. And we were limited because of the, the all that was connected to this land that had been donated. Um, and community input would have just made it more difficult. And so the board has, in, in, its, in its ability, to make such a decision, and that's how it chose to make it. Yes? I, I just want to comment on a couple of programs you have here, the P-TECH program and the IME tech program. Uh, just the way some of your instructors, like James Martin, William Cruz, and Cecil, they, they do a great job trying to continuously improve your uh, programs here. And, they come out and partner with business and so the great job we just hired five more of your graduates. So we've been out here and looked at it as a board. I think did we come out as a board or did we come yes, out? Yes, we came out uh, for an opening, I think you had Yeah. 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 I had a question regarding measure A. Um, because two of these, you know, one of the, sorry. Um, being a former student here, I kind of learned that counselors are critical to a few of these pieces, like providing, um, providing students, uh, you know, for the transfer pass for four year, um, helping students get into the class they need. Um, and I saw on the slideshow, it said, you know, for administrative costs, but does this measure A account for, you know, requiring or retract, uh, attracting and retaining 
good counselors just to make just because I don't know I think without good counselors because I, I was fortunate to have a good one throughout my two years here we wouldn't have most most of these programs could be done that's the support that you yes. need for that so yes it includes counselors okay. and instructors Can you speak to um, whether or not the how the pension reform package that the legislature passed last week will it have any impact on the community college district whatsoever? Not I don't think so. Well, it will know. for future retirees. Yes. People who uh, people who, be, who get into the system January 2013, I think, will will have will feel an impact on that. Not current. So they probably just want to Yeah. Any other questions? Don't leave this room with things that are dying, you're dying to know. Do you that? Okay, so we're done then. Thank so you. if there are no um, more questions, then there are no more answers. <laughs> <laughs> we have some food. Thank you all for coming this morning. It's a great sacrifice to get up this early. <laughs> <laughs> we Are you speaking for yourself? I think I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> That's all right. I think it's you all very great nobility and all. I think you've done extremely fine. And staying away. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for coming. And, and uh, as the president here said, you know, do take a chance to look at this campus. It, it has kind of uh, remade itself, reinvented itself over the past few years from that from that concrete core to the uh, the, the more friendly usable campus it is today so uh, if we get a chance uh, since we probably ended a little earlier we can run out there and take a look around thank you for coming thank you.